bulls versus bears. Why are stocks going up, gold going down? Shouldn't it be the other way around right now, given geopolitical events, economic events, Fed fund rate hikes, and more? I invited Mark Lopresti of the Battlefin Group, he's a co-founder over there, onto the program to shed some light on what is going on, to discuss some of the indicators the Fed is using, where are markets going? Why are they going in that direction? And uh, I think Mark is a perfect commentator for that because uh, he's a mainstream media steady. Like you're, you're constantly on Fox News and others. Thanks so much for your time, Mark. My pleasure. Time. Thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. And uh, Mark, what first time on on Soar financially here? Like, why don't you give us a quick thirty six and run, sixty second rundown on who you are, and then uh, we'll talk about the markets. <laughs> well, who who I am is a, a slightly complicated question. So, I'll give, try to give you the short version. Um, I've been on Wall Street for twenty seven years. I started out on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange working for Lehman Brothers. Did uh, went through Lehman's uh, program. Uh, for uh, a while, uh, ultimately wound up on the institutional equity sales and trading desk, uh, left Lehman to go to law school. I practiced law in the investment space for almost 20 years, uh, focused on uh, hedge funds primarily, but also family offices, uh, venture capital, alternative investments, sort of broadly speaking. About 10 or 11 years ago, I co-founded uh, Battlefin Group, uh, where I serve as a member of the board of directors and chief market strategist. Uh, I've been a market strategist uh, on uh, various uh, mainstream media shows for about 15 years, CNBC, Fox Business, TV Ameritrade, and Progeny, uh, radio show on Sirius XM, various podcasts and things of that nature where I talk about financial markets. And I left the practice of law about four, well, three years ago now um, to focus on a, a, on Battlefin, of course, um, uh, on the market strategy side of things. And on a small multifamily office that I started about uh, four years ago. Um, so uh, lawyer, investor, entrepreneur, um, and, uh, and lover of, of, of markets is probably the, <laughs> the simplest way. Lover of markets. I didn't see that yeah. in your Twitter profile. So <laughs> I think you should add that. I think that's fantastic. Um, Mark, you're often a commentator, as I mentioned, on like mainstream media as well. And mm -hmm. uh, what do they, inv A, what do they invite you for? And B, like, what kind of feedback are you giving them? Because I'm really one getting a sense of like, what, what's this, what's the out there, right? Like, yeah, what, what's sure. Happening? Well, I mean, what, what I'm asked to cover depends on the show. Um, some shows are uh, individual stock specific where I'm asked to sort of, give my three bull calls or three bear calls for that particular day or that particular week. Um, other shows I cover sort of more of a global macro perspective. Some of the things you talked about at the top of the interview, what's happening with interest rates, employment, inflation, the possibility of a recession, geopolitical type of uh, influences. So it, it depends on the show. Um, and in terms of sentiment right now, the, the one a uh, simple way that I could sort of describe it um, is is volatility and a little bit of confusion, because as I think you also pointed out, we have um, some very interesting and in some instances, historically confusing indicators, the bond market and the equity markets correlation by way of example is something we haven't seen in, in 20 some odd years based on most analyses. So um, it's definitely a hard or harder to make money in markets like this. But um, as I said, uh, just on, a, on a, a radio show, I do this uh, every Monday and Friday called Bulls, Bears and Blockchain. It came out this morning at 830 a.m. before the markets open. Um, smart investors make money during periods of volatility. It's very hard to make money when the market's not trending in any particular direction. So when markets are moving and when volatility reigns supreme, as it is in these conditions, there is actually quite a lot of opportunity to capture some profits. What, what kind of secular trend are we in right now? What would you say? Is this more of a bull market, more of a bear market? I'm, I'm honestly quite confused because some of the stocks are going up and rallying. Seems like risk is off and everybody's running, jumping in again, liquidity returning. But then I look at the commodities, of course, and uh, we're just getting beat to a pulp, right? So what... When, when you talk a main market, like what is driving market? What is driving volatility for you? And why are we in an uptrend? Well, so I think the trend is um, is leaning bullish. I think uh, a lot of the data sets, and of course, you know, with Battlefin, um, data is everything that we do. Uh, you know, we were sort of early adopters of these concepts of alternative data sets. 
um, things that uh, traditional investors, traditional market analysts and watchers would, would not look at. And we can get into what that means. But if I look at things, for example, like the use of leverage by hedge funds, Goldman Sachs came out with a report Monday or Tuesday of last week, I think, that they surveyed $2.3 plus trillion dollars in assets under management among professional money managers, hedge funds, the guys that are supposed to be the smartest traders in the business. And their uh, leverage uh, that they were securing was at uh, an almost all-time high, right? So what does that mean, right? You back up the truck with leverage when you're positioning to buy, when you're positioning to go into individual names and, and, and options and things like the VIX. And I think if you look at how uh, the tech sector, sector has performed um, year to date, those are certainly indications of a bit of a rotation from risk off and value to risk on. So we're definitely starting to see risk assets uh, have a, a better appetite from investors, notwithstanding mixed signals from the market. And of course, look, when you ask what's driving everybody's uh, uh, thoughts these days, it, it is of course the Fed, the feckless Fed as I uh, coined them uh, last year, uh, because we have a Federal Reserve that is essentially admittedly playing catch up. They should have started uh, what they started uh, uh, last year much, much earlier. It was perhaps as much as two quarters prior to when they started raising rates um, and and uh, and using indicators that are lagging in some instances as much as a quarter or longer. So it really isn't just a question of is the Fed going to get it right and the timing of whether or not the Fed's going to get it right, but is the market accurately predicting and pricing in what that anticipated Fed action is going to be. And that that's that's the trick these days. Yeah, just coming back to the commodities, it seems like we started to sniff out that we're smarter than the Fed. Like we're front running the Fed and gold ran up, silver ran up. Yeah. And now now the Fed said, well, we might be raising rates longer than expected. Now gold is down, silver is down. You know, like how many more Fed rate hikes do you predict personally? Like where do you where do you think there is an end? I was saying jokingly before we started recording that some of the commentators I had on the program here on Soar Financially as well said, that, well, well, 2%, they can't raise above 2%. Well, then it was 4%. Now we're talking about 6%. Are we going to talk well, about 8% next week? Or like, I'm being facetious here, but uh, like, where's the limit? I, I cert Well, certainly I, I hope that uh, but most everything above two is is facetious, but, but certainly, you know, uh, not impossible. I think most of what we are hearing, and, and by the way, we have one Fed governor or another speaking literally every single day this week. We had the FOMC minutes, the minutes of the last uh, Fed meeting where we saw a 25 basis point hike come out last week. Investors pouring through those minutes to try to read the tea leaves to determine whether the tone has become more hawkish or, or dovish. Um, I, I think that you know we're, we're, there's still... Certainly, all indications from Fed speak is still around that two percent target, um, and I think if we go much past that, that we could wind up in a stagflation situation, and, and I think that's where a lot of the the jitters in the market are coming from. But the volatility, the interim volatility that we're seeing, yes, that's a a, a high level concern, but I think it's more about the day to day uh, practical. Uh, uh, Indicators that are at odds with each other, right? We're we're sort of seeing a, a market that's that's giving us bi bipolar indications. On on the one hand, the employment numbers continue to be strong, uh, yet we and, and consumer spending and and consumer sentiment continues to be strong. The economy appears to be strong in many ways, yet we're seeing uh, rates of consumer credit card balances at a pre at highs we have not seen since well before the pandemic, possibly reaching all time highs. The savings rate at a 50-year low by one uh, report and one analysis that I saw last week. And certain companies reporting, we're coming to the end of Q4 22 earnings season here this week with the last spate of companies reporting between now and Friday and a mixed bag, right? You're seeing some companies reporting strength and continued consumer demand, not expressing that demand destruction that we would expect in an inflationary and rising rate environment that we are undoubtedly in. Um, and other companies, big box retailers, Lowe's, Home Depot, that both reported the week before last, indicating weakness. And then, of course, that correlation 
that we see very rarely between the bond market and the equity market. So the volatility that we're seeing uh, week to week is occasioned more as a result of that mixed bag and sometimes contradictory indicators that should traditionally be telling more of a unified signal to investors. Now, you, you keep bringing up indicators and it brought me to the question. I was like, what kind of indicators would you use for the Fed? Mm-hmm. If you were Jerome Powell, like, what would you be looking at? Like, what's really relevant? Like, that is not as lagging. Like, unemployment numbers, those are usually lagging quite a bit until they really seep through and to really, like, showcase what, how the economy is really doing. So what, what kind of indicators would you use, Mark? Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the good thing about the jobless numbers is we get them weekly, right, which is, which is actually probably the most – um, up to date or current of the indicators that the Fed uses to make its determinations. So, and, and that is, of course, one of the most important um, metrics that's used uh, by the Fed in determining monetary policy. Chairman Powell stating over and over again that until uh, weakness is demonstrated in uh, the employment market, the employment picture, that he's going to keep the foot, the hawkish foot, firmly on the gas and, and, and rising rates. We look at um, some of the things like I've already mentioned, uh, the rate of uh, consumer credit card balances, uh, the, the the savings rate, uh, used car prices, uh, the price of uh, uh, critical uh, commodities, food and things of that nature. Um, a lot of what we see in, in the PCE and the PCI numbers that we can actually derive on a much more current and real time basis than waiting for those monthly or quarterly numbers to come out. No, no, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, you, you mentioned a lot of contradicting indicators. It's really tough to make sense of what is going on. Like housing prices, of course, are crashing. Like if you look at the housing side, I think all the indicators are pretty much down. Um, but others are up. And even the un- you, you mentioned the unemployment rate, I think is the best example. All of a sudden they're dropping. I think we're at 3.4% unemployment rate. Um, how do we find a recession? Like apparently we were in a recession for two quarters, but uh, nobody really acknowledged that. We're now we're not in a recession anymore. Uh how would you define that? And like, how healthy is the economy really? Like, and how do you gauge that? It feels like it just depending on what side of the coin you're on or what side of the spectrum you're on, you're either in a recession or you're not. Yeah, well, it, de- it depends on your perspective, right? And so, look, and this is one thing that does drive me a little bit crazy with this administration and this Fed, and not not to get political, but but there is an element of that in all of this. And, and that is to say we had a definition of what makes a recession which seemed to work for many decades, right? Until it didn't work to suit with the, you know, the narrative of of what is necessary to support what has been this inexcusably delayed Fed action, right? Which I was talking about before, which led me to give that, uh, give Jerome Powell and this Fed, that feckless Fed uh, uh, label or moniker. Um, So, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, what you really need to uh, try to understand when looking at particularly individual names is sort of go back to the basics. We're talking about individual equities here. So companies, yes, we're seeing more appetite for risk. We're seeing uh, investors, myself included, uh, picking up names that were were battered in 2022 that that performed really, really well uh, in 2023 year to date. Companies like Tesla, companies like NVIDIA, uh, even Microsoft taking out the chat GPT uh, nonsense. Um, so when we're looking at uh, how to deploy capital in individual names, we're looking at things like balance sheet strength, how much debt's on the balance sheet, how sensitive are, is a company's performance going to be relative to what we know is going to be a rising rate environment, right? At, at least through that that 2% goal, which means at least through 2023, um, and, and those are the kind of things that we look at when we try to determine how to deploy our, our own capital. Yeah. Can, can you describe your portfolio mix just a little bit as well? Like I saw U.S. Treasury bonds, the one years are at over 5%. Uh, are you throwing that in there at all? Because 5% is, you know quite high and something not to laugh at right it it, it, it is um i I'm, I'm not i'm not a bond trader and then and never was so i'm sort of the, the wrong guy to ask when it comes to that kind of thing um and i think that there are other types of products there that are uh, you know more liquid uh and can generate an even better yield than just buying uh treasuries uh so we would we would typically look at other things to to replicate uh, an enhanced uh, treasury return there are there are ETFs by way of example that that um are very good options the the portfolio 
Um, and we're talking about my personal portfolio and, and that of a, a small portfolio that we run within the family office. We don't take outside capital. We don't run a hedge fund just from, to be clear, I've got to put the lawyer hat on here for a second. Um, it is, it is, it is somewhat um, tech heavy. We, we, we tend to like uh, uh, tech companies. We like data driven companies. We look going back to what we do with Battlefin. We look for uh, a data strategy, a clearly defined data strategy in, in, in companies that are within and outside of, of tech. Um, and how they're utilizing the data to make uh, better decisions uh, across the supply chain. Um, we're liking, uh, as I mentioned on my radio show this morning, um, companies that are involved in the auto parts uh, sector. We saw a great report last week out of O'Reilly Automotive. We have a couple of other names in the sector reporting this week. As new car supply, because of supply chain and, and uh, issues and things of that nature, uh, remains high. Used car prices remain high. We had a blip. Last week, that indicated that used car prices started coming down. Problem is, at the same time, wholesale used car prices indicated they continued rise, right? Which means the dealerships and the car dealers have to pay more at higher interest rates to buy those used vehicles to put them on the lot. So I think any uh, interim blip in in uh, to the downside in, in used car prices, unfortunately, is going to be very short lived. So people are going to have to continue to invest in the cars that we have. In fact, we saw last week uh, an all-time high of per of uh, individuals purchasing their cars out of their lease programs. We have not seen this this number, this rate of of drivers of buying their cars at the point of the of that option being uh, something within their lease. Um, again, because of supply and demand, because of the, the price of new cars, the price of used cars. Um, so we look at a lot of those indicators to try to determine the overall health of the economy and, and who the winners and losers are going to be as we are uh, looking through, through a volatile period that's expected to continue. Um, this week in particular, we're calling for quite a lot of volatility. The companies that will do well and, and, and those that will suffer in, in these types of conditions. Mark, allow me to sort of wrap up our conversation with the last question. Like, sure. when you wake up in the morning, what's the first indicator you check? Uh, whether or not my espresso machine is functioning <laughs> properly. So power. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I. Uh, that's true. I, actually, um, um, I look. Of course, I look at the. I look at the futures, right? I, I look at the. I look at the bond market. I look at what happened overnight in Asia, in Europe. Um, I look at the. Uh, the you know where natural gas is. I look at uh, oil prices. Um, not there's there's nothing uh, unique I think in terms of 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 the of the morning routine. Um, I don't go to the alternative data crystal ball uh, to to tell me what happened in the in the overnight. I definitely start um, with those same uh, sort of macro uh, type and and market specific indicators that that most investors start with. And then you know once you start to develop a sense directionally, right? Not only as to the, the equities markets, uh, options markets, fixed income markets, and commodities markets at at a, at a high level, then then you know you might start to drill down, right? Um, and if we're talking about adjusting a position in oil and gas, I might look at um, uh, fleet tanker data, right? So we actually have data sets that indicate you know how uh, where these ships sit while they're floating around, indicating, you know, how much oil is really on board or how much, you know, natural gas is really on board in the transportation side of things. Or, or we might look, take a snapshot to see uh, how dramatically, if at all, uh, the indicator as it relates to the consumer debt picture uh, looks like, because we, we do actually have intra-week uh, uh, some pretty significant changes uh, in, that, in that picture. Um, and that can sort of help to inform. So, I mean, these are just some examples of of how we start with the macro stuff that's been tried and true for a long time, and then start to layer on the more specific alternative data. Gotcha. Is, is the S and P five hundred going to close over four thousand this week? <laughs> <laughs> if I, if I knew that, um, I, I I actually look. Um, I actually do feel that this this will be a, a decent week for stocks. Volatile, without a doubt. Um, but but my gut tells me is that uh, we will end the week higher than we started. That's Fantastic. that's as much as I'm willing to tell you. <laughs> all right, that's all good. Perfect. <laughs> I, I, I like putting people on the spot and see just to see how they react. Right, and uh, really appreciate it, Mark. Where can we find more of you? Uh, you can find me on uh, Twitter. Uh, most of the shows and things I do on mainstream media 
as well as our uh, podcasts, uh, our daily Rebels Edge show that I do with uh, Pete and John Najarian, my friends and business partners over at Market Rebellion. Most all of that can be found uh, through the promotions that we do and click throughs on Twitter. So you can find me on Twitter at MXLESQ is the handle. That's the easiest. Fantastic. I'll put that in the description below as well. And Mark, really appreciate your time. It's great that we finally got to meet and catch up here. And uh, we'll have you back on soon and uh, probably see you in New Orleans in October as well. You definitely so. will. I'm looking forward to that. Fantastic. Mark, thank you so much. Everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. This was Soar Financial. We hope you enjoyed the episode with Mark Lopresti. Go check him out on Twitter and uh, Battlefino as well. Some really interesting data they're providing. And uh, appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Follow us. Subscribe. It's that little square box at the bottom. It says subscribe on it. It doesn't hurt. Because I know only 85 to 90% of you watching are not subscribed yet. Let's change that. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. We'll be back with lots more.